In many power electronic applications, MOSFETs are used as switching elements. My name is Stef Wintraken and welcome to this video in which I will discuss the losses which may occur in these MOSFETs. So let's start with the symbol of a MOSFET and this is a symbol for an N-channel MOSFET in which we have the gate over here, the drain over there and here we have the source. And we can replace that MOSFET by a switching element. So it can be seen more or less like a switch. And within that MOSFET there is also a parasitic diet, the body diet, which is always there. So, so we have to take the losses also of that body diet into account. Now we have two situations for using that MOSFET in a switching application. When we have a voltage supply between the gate and the source and that voltage uh, UGS is higher than the threshold voltage, then the channel between the drain and the source will be in conduction. So it will conduct current. So we can um, model that as a switch being close between that drain and that source. And um, because it's not an uh, infinitely good switch, we can replace that switch by a resistor RDS. A, switch, uh, a resistor RDS, so a, a resistor between the drain and the source, which is there in the on situation. So it's an RDS on. And when the switch is closed, then a current will flow, a current ID, uh, from the drain towards the source. In the situation at the voltage, between the gate and the source is lower than the threshold voltage, then the channel between the drain and the source is not conducting current. So the switch is open and the current ID is 0 amps. Well, now let's look to an example uh, in which we have a so-called quasi-unipolar H-bridge. And when you want to know more about um, H-bridge topologies, please look to the video in my channel. This is a quasi-unipolar uh, unipolar H bridge, also call, called a sine magnitude H bridge. And we have four MOSFETs in that H bridge, Q1, Q2, Q3 and Q4. And you see that these MOSFETs have been replaced in this circuit diagram by a switch, the main behavior of that MOSFET, and we have that internal parasitic body diet. So this is one MOSFET, that is one MOSFET, this is one MOSFET, and of course, this is one MOSFET in one package. Okay, now let's look to the behavior in which MOSFET Q4 is closed for every time. So the MOSFET is in conduction, so we can replace that by a closed switch over here. And we put PWM to MOSFET Q1 and the inverse PWM to MOSFET Q3. So when we put a positive voltage between the gate and the source of Q1, so that voltage applied to this switch, so we can see that by um, uh, closing that switch, a current will flow from the power supply through Q1, through the motor over here, through Q4, back to the ground. In the negative part of the PWM, Q1 will be opened, but because there is an inductor in the motor, the current will um, try to keep, uh, keep on flowing through that motor, so there should be another um, current path for that current to flow. And that current path is over here between the motor Q4 and then back through the MOSFET Q3 over here, because remember the inverse PWM is put to Q3. So when Q1 is opened, Q3 is closed and then we have this as a current path for the current to flow. So the current will flow through this path over here. But um, there is one problem. When we, ha we have two MOSFETs in series, we have to be aware about cross-conduction because when both Q1 and Q3 are conducting at the same time, we have a short circuit between the supply voltage over here and the ground over there. 
and then my MOSFET will or my H bridge will blow up because there is an infinite high current flowing through these MOSFETs. So we have to make what we call a break before make contact. First of all, we have to put Q1 out of conduction, break, before we put Q3 into conduction, make. So break Q1 before we make Q3. And in that dead time between the uh, breaking of Q1 and the making of Q3, the current of the motor still has to be able to flow. So in that small period, the current will flow through Q4 through the body diode D3 of this MOSFET package back to the motor again. So in the time between breaking and making, the current will flow through Q4 and the body diode D3. So now let's have a look to the complete dissipation of all uh, losses within MOSFET Q3. Okay, so this is my symbol for the MOSFET. We have seen it over there. We're looking to the heat dissipation of that MOSFET. And we have a couple of MOSFET losses. First of all, we have conduction losses, I squared R losses, because we can replace that switch of that MOSFET by a resistor RDS on. So we have always conduction losses. When we have a switch amplifications, we also have switching losses. And then we have gate charge losses to be able to charge the gates, so putting this MOSFET into conduction. We have internal diode losses due to that um, part of the switching period in which the current is flowing through that body diode. And last and more or less least, we have fast recovery losses. So now we will um, discuss all these five losses one by one. Let's start with the conduction losses. So we have replaced this MOSFET by a switch over here, which has to be which is modeled by a resistor RDS on. So it's a resistor between resistance between the drain and the source in the on situation. Well, the complete conduction losses can then be calculated by um, multiplying the the current squared ID squared times the RDS on over here. So the conduction losses are. I squared R losses, so it's the current flowing through that MOSFET over here, squared times um, the, um, the RDS on, so the replacement resistance of that MOSFET. But when you have a switching application shown over here, only in a part of that switching period, the current is flowing. So in this part, current is flowing, in that part, current is not flowing, flowing, not flowing and so on. So we have a duty cycle. So we have the, to multiply the, these conduction losses with duty cycle D. So then we get conduction, uh, conduction losses, which are uh, equal to ID squared times ID is on times the duty cycle D. Then we have the switching losses and um, we can um, look um, to the switching losses by discussing two types of loads. First of all, let's look to a resistive load of this um, MOSFET over here. And when we, have, when we switch this uh, MOSFET over here, then we close um, that switch over here from the open uh, position to the closed position. And of course, that can, cannot be infinitely fast. So there is a time between the, uh, the, the, the opening of the switch and the closing of the switch. And that is put in this figure over here, in which we have the time on this horizontal axis and the voltage and the current on the vertical axis. And what we see by switching this, um, so closing this MOSFET, we see that the voltage has to drop from the VDS, so a voltage it had towards zero, and the current between drain and the source will start to flow from zero to the uh, N value over here. So this happens when the switch is closed, so in the on time of the switch, but it also happens only reversed in the off time of the switch. So when it's um, switching from the closed position to the open position, and then the voltage will increase again and the current will decrease again. So the switching losses for resistive loads 
are equal to 1 over 6 times the voltage UDS, the voltage between drain and source, times the, um, the current flowing through the, through the drain, so ID in on situation, ID on, times the combination of T on plus T off, because it's happening during the on time and during the off time, times the switching frequency. And that is for a resistive load. So again, switching losses are equal to 1 over 6 times UDS times ID in the on situation times T on plus T off times the switching frequency. And for a, um, a motor amplifier, it's often, uh, let's say, 20 kilohertz. But for instance, for a DC-DC converter, it can be much higher, for instance, 200 kilohertz or even higher, up to 1 megahertz. When your load is inductive, this um, the figure changed a little bit and then the switching losses are equal to the same formula over here only the 1 over 6 is replaced by 1 over 2 so 0 0.5 okay these were the switching losses then we have the gate charge losses and for the gate charge losses we have to look to the dynamic model of a MOSFET and in that MOSFET equivalent scheme we are defining three capacitance value which are valid, which are applicable and uh, which are there in that MOSFET package between the gate and the drain, the CGD, which is also called the Miller capacitance, between the gate and the source, this value, CGS, and between the drain and the source, which is the capacitance CDS. And of course, we also have a gate resistance because that resistance is not infinitely low. And because of that, every time we have to switch MOSFET, these capacitance values have to be charged. And then we can calculate the gate charge losses by multiplying the gate source voltage over here, so the gate uh, uh, source voltage times the gate charge, QG, times the switching frequency. And of course, this, this gate charge at QG is depending on the values of these capacitance which are um, in that MOSFET uh, package. And you can find this gate charge within the data sheet of your MOSFET. Then we have the internal diode losses. And we have seen that the internal diode losses um, are applicable during the dead time between the breaking and the making of two MOSFETs which are in series in an age bridge. So in the situation that Q1 is going to break and Q3 is going to make. So we have Q, we put Q1 out of conduction and the time between that break, uh, bringing Q1 out of conduction and the time between Q3 bringing into conduction. And uh, of course, also the other way around. So the internal diode losses are equal to the forward voltage of this diode because in that time in that dead time the current was flowing through that body diode over here so we have to calculate these diode losses by using the forward voltage of this diode times the current flowing over here which is id times t on plus t off because that break before make happens um, every time we switch q1 and q3 so it's from uh, into conduction to non into conduction and into conduction to non into conduction times the switching frequency. And when you have a smart MOSFET driver, um, it measures um, the time when one uh, MOSFET is not conducting and the other one may start to conduct. And then we uh, can add the T on plus T off as the total time, the total dead time in which the internal diode losses. Uh, occur but when you have a uh, not that smart MOSFET driver you probably have to implement that time by yourself either by hardware or in software and in that case we have to replace that that time over here by these times plus an extra dead time which you apply by yourself so if there is an extra dead time you have to take that into account in this calculation over here and then we have the last part of the losses which are the reverse recovery losses and these are due to the fact that also this um, body diet has a parasitic capacitance in practice and we can calculate these reverse recovery losses from that internal uh, diet uh, in the stage 
that that um, uh, body diet is going from conducting to non-conducting and it can be calculated by multiplying QRR which is the charge of that capacitance that parasitic capacitance of this body diet times UDS which is the voltage between drain and source times the switching frequency and also this value QRR so the charge of that um, capacitance which is the parasitic capacitance of this body diet you can find that value in the data sheet of your MOSFET so putting it all together we have five types of MOSFET losses we always have conduction losses PC when we have a switch mode application which we have when we have a PWM application then we have also switching losses and remember that these two parts of the MOSFET losses are the most important ones these are the big contributions and then we add the gate charge losses the internal diet losses and the fast recovery losses so these two parts are the most important one but I emphasize always that um, it's, it's good to calculate all these parts and then you see um, which part are dominant and which part aren't dominant and when you put these uh, parts all together then you have the total uh, losses in your MOSFET and you can calculate the MOSFET temperature of course the junction temperature and see whether that meets um, the uh, specification in your data sheet and remember last but not least you can find all the parameters which I discuss in this presentation in the data sheet of your MOSFET well, that's everything about um, MOSFET losses. Thank you for watching and I see you next time.